Um, good afternoon. My name is Stuart Robinson. I'm Corporate Services Manager at um, Sport Number Two. And uh, thank you all for coming along. I know you've probably already been to Tasmania before, but uh, it's my first opportunity to be able to pass that on. Hope you've enjoyed the sessions so far today. Um, I'd like to be able to introduce, introduce to you um, John Fowler. Um, John is a, going to be discussing board ethics and conflict resolution. So John has a very extensive um, history and uh, past experience. First off, started as a legal counsel, I believe, um, corporate lawyer, tax consultant, um, and has also worked for Toyota for <coughs> years since 1986. Um, and in a fantastic role, a corporate services type role. <laughs> so, you know, good, good to see. Um, John's um, also very heavily involved in the Toyota Race Series. So he's very proud to know that even his USB drive here is from the Toyota Race Series. <laughs> so we shouldn't have any problems with speed from the point of view of the delivery of the actual presentation today. Yeah, so I'll pass it on to John. And if anybody saw me parking before, or can see the car now, I'm bloody hard for parking. <laughs> so it how many cameras or sensors you've got on a car, you've still got to park it properly. Um, so basically, I guess what, I, what I'm doing now, I, I, a couple of years ago, I had been a general manager at Toyota, I work basically from home, and I do um, corporate legal work and also look after the Toyota Racing Series, part of which, and that's been going for um, 12 years now, so it's well embedded in the sort of motor racing um, scene in New Zealand. One of the things we've just set up though is we've set up a trust called the Kiwi Driver Fund because a lot of the drivers that have been coming through the series have been international, which is really great. But it's, as you all know yourselves, I'm sure, it's hard to raise money in New Zealand. And our drivers <laughs> have um, a lot of um, challenges trying to get money to sort of get across the line and get, get known and get, get themselves sort of some good practice and be seen internationally. So what we've done with that, we've set up the separate trust key with the key driver. <coughs> and last year I was just saying that we managed to actually pay for the engine and chassis leases for all the three Kiwi drivers that raced in the series. So we had 17 internationals, and of course we all know that they've all got a lot of money. We had the Hapsburgs from Austria, we had the guy that had just sold Michael Kors and Tommy Hilfiger the year before with his son, uh, you know, flying in and then these jets and things. That's all very nice. But in New Zealand, we're going to make our sports people really get off the international stage, then we have to actually set up things like this. We have to run these things properly and make sure that we can keep the money flowing. So I guess this is sort of a subject that's really near my heart, because I was also um, county secretary at Toyota for a long time. So this whole sort of board structure thing is really important. And increasingly with governance, and I know you're going to be talking about health and safety soon as well, when you're running a board of any description, there are a lot of um, quite onerous duties placed on people, but if they are explained simply and just worked out with common sense, you can actually work through them all. Um, I'll try and make this, you know, we'll try and get through it reasonably quickly. Tell me to slow down if you want me to, because I don't want to slow down too much and have everybody go to sleep. I know it's late afternoon. But if you want to interrupt or ask something or add something, you think, you think I maybe haven't sort of quite fleshed out enough, just do so. I like being interrupted. So first thing is, um, why do we have ethics? Well, I guess the point is that um, when we're looking at any field, the point about that is what's our role, how do we conduct ourselves, what's the impression that we want to give to people that are dealing with us? And this is where this Kiwi driver fund is an interesting thing too, because we've got these international people coming, and we don't want them to think that our Kiwi drivers are being favoured. So that's why we've separated out into a trust. And that's one of the things that that separation can give you. Um, and it particularly applies when you're looking at financial matters. So really it's about what rules do we need around conflict of interest. I'm going to block that screen every now and then, sorry. Um, conflict of interest and personal gain. But so ultimately it's social, political and legal, really, the whole, the whole gamut of everything. Um, what happens when we breach them? Well, we can show bad moral character and the community notices. When we breach the rules of self-regulation, we get peer pressure on us. So a couple of things, I, I chair the Manawatu Community Law Centre in Timanawa. So organisations like that, for instance, the Community Law Centre, we've got the Ministry of Justice looking after it, over our shoulders, and we're, we're responsible to them. For Timanawa, we're using um, uh, money from the Palmerston City Council and Manawatu Council, so the, the ratepayers are going to be watching us. I think the real key, though, is within any organisation, it's about collegial support and self-regulation. 
if you have to be looked at from outside and have people come in and inspect you and find out that things are wrong, then that's wrong. The other thing too, and it's a principle that I try and get across in all the organisations I'm with is, tell people to blow the whistle. If they think something's wrong, then say something about it. Within a company, you've got the whole whistleblower that protects the Disclosures Act structure. But in any organisation, you should be saying to people, if you think something's wrong, say something about it. If you don't get anywhere, go to someone else. And sometimes, yes, people can be annoying, but sometimes they can also have a real point about what they're behind what they're saying. In the motor industry, of course, just last year, we had this huge fuss with um, Volkswagen and their of course, it wouldn't be Toyota or Lexus. Um, <laughs> but with their diesel engine technology, where they that actually produced a way of um, cheating the, the testers that were being used. And I, I quite like the, the train, of course. But when you look at it, you see, if you look about Germany and Greece within the European community, Germany was saying how how good they were, and they were all very virtuous and everything. And you know, these Greeks are just just you know dross. Well, actually, the Germans were cheating like hell at emissions. So um, you've got to be careful sometimes to get up when you're on your high horse. And of course, as far as FIFA is concerned, I mean, yeah, well, what do you need to say about that? Nothing really, do you? Um, so a lot of these things are things that, um, you know, you, you look at it, if something looks like it's wrong, then it probably is. So in terms of, of um, getting back into the, these structures, if you look at it, going right back to the 1500s, and Mackie really said that people are more prone to do evil than good. That's a fairly cynical view, I'm not sure it's true. But when we got through to the 2000s, there was this real cult of self, you know, the whole Wall Street thing came through, and, you know, um, greed was good, all that sort of nonsense. And it sort of produced a mindset of, it's okay if I don't get caught. And then what happened, of course, you had the Enron crisis over in the US, where Enron, the power company, was making up the box to pump up their share price, then the whole thing collapsed like a house of cards. And I think really what people started to think was, actually some things just are wrong. And if it looks wrong, then it probably is. And that's the real common sense approach. So how do we apply it down through into our organisations? Um, you know, Maslow, the um, psychologist, self, said that people should be self-actualised. They should actually just simply have things embedded within themselves. And if they're strong, whether it's in disagreement or opposition, they can actually stand up for the truth at great personal cost. And there have been some examples around, you know, his, through history of people that have done that. But the real point is that every day we need to make a choice to lie or be honest, to steal or not steal, and each of those choices is a, is a growth opportunity. I just heard the other day about another organisation where somebody was working in and in over a period of time managed to steal something like about sixty odd thousand dollars out of it. You know, that's the sort of thing that if people don't have the right sort of ethics behind them. What are New Zealand rugby doing with a Ford, for God's sake? Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> just this sort of, sorry, just the sort of thing I know um, <laughs> People that, that can do that, they can only do it if there's a culture that, that semi allows them to do it. Oh, they are actually sponsored by the <laughs> so what you really want, you want to sort of um, uh, really have a cycle of, um, of trust and respect within all organisations so that people all know that you're working for an organisation that, that's got good ethics, that it's, that, but also that means that people will keep an eye on each other to a certain extent. And you won't have those sorts of problems. So what about duties of boards and directors? So a bit of legal stuff. So, You've got the Incorporated Societies Act. Now, I think Will covered some of this material earlier on in the day, so... Um, no, he didn't. Oh, he really didn't. Didn't. No, he told us that we go to him and get these sorted, but didn't actually tell us the detail. Oh, good boy, he's selling yeah. services for yeah. the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Okay. No, he, yeah, that's, that, that is also true. <laughs> But when you actually boil it down, what are the duties? Act in good faith, always act in the society's best interests, um, ensure that you're working in accordance with the rules and objectives, first of all you've got to know them then, ensure that there's no risk to the society's creditors, and you've got to watch that because when you get into a situation sometimes where an organisation does go belly up, things can get pretty personal in terms of liability. Um, 
You've also got to make sure always that, that you're not incurring obligations that you can't fulfill. And with any organisation, and all of your organisations are going to be the same, you can actually back up some big bills quite quickly if you're not careful. So you've got to just always keep a watch on that. Um, take reasonable care in carrying out the duties. And reasonable is the really important thing. And I'm sure this will come across in your health and safety discussions as well. People aren't expected to be perfect or be saints. Is that bloody cool again? Um, <laughs> but, um, you're not expected to be a saint, but you are expected to act as a reasonable person would act. And it's a legal concept. And it came through the rules of negligence back in the um, 50s and 60s. And the judge in New Zealand that first brought the concept into New Zealand law said, you do the things that would be considered reasonable by the person on the island bay bus. A normal person working in society with good values, do what that person would do, and, and you're acting reasonably. And of course, obviously, you can't profit personally from a position of trust. And that also goes to families. And ultimately, you sort of can get into a situation where people employ uh, family members and things like that. Just put it It's just better to be right out of it. <coughs> and of course, directors and board members have individual responsibilities, and they can fight. As I said before, you've got to act reasonably at all times and with good intention. But inattention and carelessness can also start to creep in, and things can sort of start to get a little bit muddy. Um, so you need to understand the field that you're working in, um, and you need to keep abreast of current developments and what's happening, and not just rely on reports. Understand, you know, um, understand them, but also question them. And a couple of the boards that I'm on, I know, because I've, got a, I've done a lot of financial work and, and legal work, I can look at things like that. But then I'm also on the board of Mass Trust here, which does a lot of healthcare work. So I've got to actually read a hell of a lot of stuff that I'm not necessarily that um, interested in quite the right word. It's not one of my things, but I also don't know that much about it. So I've actually got to ask questions and not be embarrassed to ask what seems to be a silly question, because there isn't actually ever a silly question. Because you'll find that somebody, oh, like, okay, so I know about finance things. You'll find sometimes somebody who doesn't, necessarily have my financial background, <coughs> will ask the question and I'll go, oh shit, yeah, that's right, now that's a good point. So just ask questions. Um, and also you're the eyes and ears of the outside stakeholders. And your outside stakeholders are members of a club, they're members of um, your community or society or charity or whatever, but you're their eyes and ears if you're acting in the government's role. And it's really important to discharge that, that responsibility. <coughs> Just a couple of words on types of boards and their functions. Um, different types of boards work in different ways because, and you've got to be really careful about this too, because you can have a passive or engaged board, it can be certifying or intervening, or it can be an operating one. Now, a lot of you are probably operating the clubs that you're, you're working with here, yeah? and that, that's a little bit different to some other ones. It means that as well as the day-to-day -day operations, you're also, you've got to be coming back into and looking at um, what the governance is like in the organisation. That's really quite difficult, because you've got to actually split yourself apart sometimes. Um, they've all got their part, but the right level of engagement and, and supervision is critical. There's a guy called Nardo, who, if, he's, he'll be on the um, USB you've got, but he wrote this really, he's a guy at Harvard, and he wrote this article at Sports, 15 years old now, probably, or more. But it's really good on, on how to actually operate a board properly. But the key ingredients are getting the right people <laughs> And when you're looking at the right people, it's important that the people aren't all the same. It's really important that you have different people with different skills on a board or on a, in running an organisation. So you need some people who understand money, you need some people who understand the sport that you're dealing with, because that's really important. The risks and, and the potential liabilities in the sport will vary. And say somebody like me wouldn't necessarily know what you've got to watch out for in hockey with any great detail. Well, I know a little bit. But um, or like with skiing, I mean, you've got to know what's going on with a mechanical area as well as in the sporting area. You've got to hit, set the right agenda, and when you're, when you're getting engaged in a meeting, you've got to make sure that the agenda actually covers the right topic. One of the key things in most um, agendas to always have on now, well, there are two things actually. One is health and safety, so you should always be showing that you are considering health and safety matters when you are having a meeting. And the other thing is conflicts of interest. And those two things, conflicts of interest came through very strongly about five years ago, even in company boards, after this whole Enron thing in the US and, and then making up all their books. And then the second thing is with health and safety, because it's now so critical, 
And because directors and board members can have personal liability, it's important to show that you are actually considering it. But don't just put it on the, gen uh, the agenda, discuss them as well. We'll make sure about that. And it, it doesn't mean you can't have conflicts of interest, for instance, because um, like with Mass Trust the other day, the board meeting, they were looking at buying a Yaris, which is a very good decision, of course. But what I had to do was say, well, I'm, I'm, I can't take part, any part in the decision about which type of car to buy, but I can talk about how many cars should be on the fleet and how should they be used and that sort of thing. So you see what I mean? It's, you can actually functionally separate the discussion into the two components. Because they all knew if they went board, that the, the um, CEO is that currently driving a Mazda, so I sort of hissed her really. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, did you have a question? Oh, sorry, it's just really declaring your interest in the meeting and saying how would you use it during your meeting each, each time. Yep, certainly yes. is. So like in that, in that instance, they already know that I've got a Toyota connection, I'm pretty blatant about that, aren't I? Um, but when that agenda item came up, the first thing I did was say, well, I have to right. you know, reinforce, declare my interest again, and I won't take any part in the discussion about which vehicle. Right. I tell them after. Did you have any other discussions now? Oh, they're actually going to read the deal from Toyota. So, <laughs> sorry, no, well, so do um, Sport Man on the um, But it, no, no, it's just, oh, no, we won't go into that because it's all Get me on cars and I'll bore you for hours, but honestly. Um, you've got to make sure you've got the right information. And that's got a couple of components to it as well because some of the, t some of the papers that I see come forward just have too much information. And it's like, um, I keep coming back to finance things, but just because that's one of the things I geek out on a bit, I suppose. But the thing about that is, if you give somebody a giant spreadsheet with a whole lot of columns on it, and a whole lot of subtotals and things, all sorts of things can be hidden in there. If, they, if you extract the information up a little bit and summarize it, you can actually get, sometimes get a much clearer picture. So what I always like to do is have summarized information and then exception reports. So summarise it up so you can see what the trends are, because the trend will often show you more than, than all this detail. But also, um, exception reports, what's different, what's, what's standing out, what's, what's sort of exceptional this, this month or this year or whatever. So you've got to really have that through, but ultimately underpinning the whole thing is the culture of an organisation. Because if the culture of an organisation is open and honest, <coughs> and people are encouraged to talk about things and actually ask for help too, because you often find that people, if they're not asking for help, it's because they don't feel they can. You should always feel that you can go and ask somebody, you know, hey, I don't really understand what this is, or you know, what, what should I do about this? But they're all important in balancing a government structure and making sure that, that things can actually be worked through properly to get a good result for the organisation. So what's an effective board? Um, an effective board has to concentrate on governance, in, in most cases, and then empower the CEO and the team to manage the organisation. So what it, when you're sitting in a board, what you've got to do is understand what the roles are, so if it's governance or if it's slightly <coughs> operational or a mixture of the two, and getting ready for a meeting, you've got to prepare and study for meetings. I mean, I'm sure we've all been in meetings where we know people haven't read the papers, and you don't get anywhere, do you? Some of that could be because the papers are bad, you know, so if there's too much detail for people to try and wade through, then yeah, I can believe that some people wouldn't read it. So you've got to make sure they're prepared well, and you've got to actually be prepared to read them. And I mean, I, I sometimes have to go and appear in front of the city council meetings. Don't we hear from the city council? Um, you should see the stuff these people have to read. It's just unbelievable. Um, so you've got to prepare and study for meetings. Grow in the sector understanding, that comes back to that knowledge point I was talking about earlier. You've got to be aligned to and agree with the organisational strategies. Um, if you don't agree with them, then you've got to help set new strategies. But everybody's got to actually agree with what the strategies are. And also, of course, be committed to the organisational objectives. So the composition of the board is one key to it. So as I said before, you've got to have different ranges of skills within a board so that you know that, that you're sort of covering off all the areas that you need. It's also important to actually bring in outside help. If it's Will from the Community Law Centre, another um, that's fine. Eyes on the side that that's a fairly new um, service that we've set up and we've got some funding for, so that's probably why Will's sort of got that top. And it's also part of growing his job within the, within the law centre. Um, but if you need extra outside help, obtain it. And you'll find that in most cases, you'll, 
people will do stuff pro bono. They'll, they'll come in and they'll, they'll spend some time working, working with a community organisation to help them without charging. And there's that old adage about, you, you know, advice is worth what you pay for it. But a lot of people will help with, with community organisations. If you need something, sing out, find out a way to get it. Yeah? And the composition of the board, as I said before, that's, that's really key to it. And then clear and early succession planning supports that objective. So the board should always, at least once a year, be thinking about who have you got coming through, who are new people that you can bring on board. It doesn't mean you have to kick people off, but you've got to actually have people there ready to come on through. I mean, I always had one, one of the, the clear objectives I've always had, particularly when, when I was at Toyota, was if you want to do a new job, guess what? You've got to find somebody to do your job and train them up to do it. So you've got to, got to have a balance of both those things. So you need experience, but you need to be refreshing at the same time. So <laughs> coming back to Enron, Enron um, failed and went into bankruptcy after being a market star, and they sure were. And what <coughs> happened was, anyone that's in the financial field knows about these Sarbanes-Oxley rules that came into place in the US that caused massive work for everybody here through the 2000s. But there were some really key things that the, that board had done that were just stupid. The, the board authorised partnerships with employees, went into business with employees of the organisation and their families. It was just stupid. They had an audit committee, and the audit committee didn't do anything. They just met and had lunch. And for heaven's sake, that's not do anything. Then the finance committee wasn't considering the financial implications of things. You know, this is a huge multi-billion dollar company. They weren't actually looking at proper finance reports. So you're buying an asset. First thing you've got to say is, do you get a return from it? Sometimes that can't be measured. But you can say that if by buying this asset, we're going to be able to do this or do something else or refine what we're doing. But you've got to actually look at it. Board members weren't <laughs> prepared for making decisions. They weren't reading those board papers. And <coughs> there's that, remember that Yes Minister program from the UK? There was that thing about, oh, but the minister will never agree to this. Put it in the second to last paper in the, in the last of five boxes that he took home that night. Why? Because they never get to that one. We all say, but it was in the boxes, minister. You know, that's what everyone would do. They were slipping things in that they knew people would never read. And they allowed management not to have any oversight, but then nobody blew the whistle. And, you know, I talked about the Protective Disclosures Act in New Zealand. Do you remember a, a case involving a chap called Neil Pugmire at Lake Alice? What actually led to Lake Alice being closed? And some of you are too young. But um, what happened over there was that there were all sorts of bad practices going on. This, this, this chap was a, a nurse at the hospital. He tried to get something done about it and nobody would listen. In the end, he went public and got sacked and you know, vilified. And it took about, I think, three or four years before finally the whole thing wound around. And he's, now, he's now regarded as a star in terms of compliance because he blew the whistle and he wouldn't shut up. So now that you've got this legislation where some, if somebody sees something they think is Ill um, illegal or unlawful, sorry, there's two slightly different things, in an organisation, then they can go and blow the whistle and their employment is protected, and so is their confidentiality. So they've got to go to the CEO or to a senior person. And that's really a key thing. They still don't have that in America, but um, at least we have that here. <coughs> so finally, when you go around to it, is there actually a value in doing good business? So people say, yes, well, that's all very well, but it's going to cost a whole lot of money. Actually, it really doesn't. Because if you've got a good business, um, a good business delivers value to the organisation. And Milton Friedman, who's really a, a right-wing economist in the US, said the only social responsibility in business is to make a profit. Anything else is socialism. It sounds a bit like um, Trump. No, no, Trump's much worse than that. Um, but actually, organisations owe their existence to the societies we inhabit. So we actually do have a duty to return something back to the organisations, don't we? Um, actually, the other thing is that so Brexit apparently looks like they're going up at the moment, if you've been watching yes. the your life. Bloody hell. That would be interesting. Um, so, as organisations, we actually do owe our existence to the societies that we inhabit. And also, organisations with good ethical reputations attract better employees. Who wants to work for FIFA at the moment? Um, <laughs> well, actually, no, there's probably a couple of worse examples yesterday. Um, but customers and suppliers are drawn to them as well. That's why companies like Toyota or Ford do things like getting their vehicles logoed up with, by Sportman or two or by, or by a rugby. It's because they're saying we're trying to participate in the community and that's a good thing. And ultimately customers and good suppliers are drawn to them and also employers and customers will be drawn to them. 
So that's why I think good ethics actually does make for good business. How do you support and back that up? So collegial pressure, I keep coming back to that. It's people talking to one another, making sure they're aware of what's going on in the organisation and bringing, um, <coughs> bringing um, things that might need correction forward. Support mechanisms are critical. <coughs> so you need to have a good code of ethics and behaviour, a good code of personal conduct for people. You've got to have good disclosure of financial and financial audit of any related party transactions. <coughs> and part of that in also flows through and having a good conflict of interest register and reinforce that at every meeting. Make sure those points are made really, really strongly. And develop a, a culture of respect and candor. People can tell the truth, but they do it respectfully. They have to go hand in hand. Otherwise, you just you end up with a, with a um, bit of a, a disaster. So just moving, here we go. Oh, we're doing pretty well. Moving on to conflicts of interest. So a conflict of interest is any situation in which an officer's personal interest or loyalties could affect the ability to make a decision in the best interest of an organisation. We say I didn't have a conflict with Barney Yaris was the best choice, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> so that's reasonably clear, but <coughs> if you deconstruct that, it's any situation whatsoever, it's any personal interest, financial or otherwise, and it can be related to, say, me or to my family or whatever. It's, it's personal loyalty, because personal loyalty to, in my case, to say Toyota, shouldn't influence what I do in, with respect to that decision of mass trust. Could affect, now that's really important, it doesn't say will affect, it says could affect. So even if you know very well that you're not going to influence anything, it could affect it. It's not just would affect. And it's at any decision that's being made, the thing that I think, though, is if you think you've got a conflict of interest, you probably have, and it's better to identify it. Because it's just easy, you know. Um, the, the more you actually are honest and, and upfront with things, the better you are. Because in my case, I've got so many prejudices that would be hard to sort of tell. Um, so how do you avoid conflicts? You've got to develop a conflicts register, and you've got to refresh it every time. Clear any interest at the beginning of a meeting. Make sure the person with the interest doesn't participate in the decision or influence it. So you've got to actually know your fellows sitting around the table as well. Record details of the relevant discussions. Records are really important. And I don't know how many times people get into situations where they haven't recorded something and it gets stuffed up and everything gets blown up because there's no clear record of what's been going on. So record the details and report to auditors when required. Bring them up and ask them a question. Most of your organisations are audited, aren't they? We have a, a, you know, a, a business auditor or a, a CA or somebody that's in the local community. Let's talk to them. They're usually, they'll, because remember, of course, they're dealing with their personal reputation as well. So they're going to make sure they give you good conservative advice. Um, things to avoid, employing family, or oh, it's pretty obvious, transactions with offices, businesses, and paying offices a salary when they're related. And those are all the little things that get people into trouble. <coughs> Yeah. So what if you're a um, that is choosing vehicles, for instance, and there's someone from Toyota and someone from Ford on this particular board, and, so, and those two have to stay out of the conversations, but the rest of the board have got no idea about vehicles or vehicles or whatever. Oh. Well, that's really the same as if you're dealing with anything that you don't know about. Yeah. So what, in, in most of the cases like that, what you have to look at, there, there are some financial things as well. So your vehicle's a good example with me, because I, I can't influence what it is, but you, you look at it and you say, well, okay, what's the price of, this, of these two vehicles? Is one cheaper than the other? What's the reputation of them? That's the thing I can't talk about. Because no, I can't say I can't mention anything, so I'll offend somebody by mentioning their vehicle. But um, you, know, you can say, well, okay, I know those ones aren't particularly reliable, or, oh, they, that's a bead up diesel, you don't want those there, cheats. Okay. Um, but, um, so, but I can't even really say get yeah, into that sort of discussion. But in the, the contrast though, so I can't say don't buy a VW diesel with cheats. What I can say is you've got to look carefully at the, at the, um, the, the supposed economy of a diesel versus the petrol. So, you see, so I can talk about that because that's something that I, I know about but it's not my interest. But I can't then get into that selection. Right? So you've got to, it, it's, it's just, yeah, you've got to be a little bit cautious. And, and when in doubt, it's better not to be involved. 
What will happen though, so say there's six people on the board, two people come and your son will do anything. The other four will have information that's come forward. And if they haven't got enough information, they can ask for more. That's another point actually. If you think you're heading into making a decision and you haven't got enough information to make a good one, don't make one. Nothing's that urgent. None of us are running the early warning system for the US nuclear terror, right? You know what I mean? It's like, I used to say at Toyota, we're a car company, all right? We're not running the nuclear deterrent, all right? If we, we delay a decision by a week to make a, a better decision, we've made a better decision. No one's going to die, you know, so we're not a 747 about to land at Auckland Airport or anything, you know what I mean? So delay things if you need to. And if you think there's not enough information, or if it's not clear, make people clarify it. And as I say, sometimes that can mean you, you've got to go and talk to somebody else. You get to get a little bit more info. Nobody ever got, got um, criticised for that. Mind you, there's also the rule, get enough information to make a decision and make it. But that's, you know, you've got to, that's, that's just a balancing act. Okay. Um, so basically, good practice is not about fulfilling the strict legal requirements. We can all tick boxes. But it requires active participation, collegial action, and a watching eye of the ethical and moral so it's ethical and moral as well as the legal responsibility of all members. That's me. Any other questions or Q&A? The other thing... Can I ask one question? Should the odd numbers or even numbers? I don't even think it matters. Um, yeah, some people say have an odd number so that you can't ever get a, a two-way split. If you've got four board members and you get a two-two split, it means there's not enough information or the decision is not ready to be made, in my view. Um, if you've got a if you've got a five-member board, you can get three people ganging up on the other two anyway. So you know. So no, I don't really think it matters. I think what's more important is the attitudes and the knowledge of the people. That's why I said it's really important in my view to have different skill levels. So you've got to have somebody that sort of knows about finance, you've got to have somebody that knows about the support that you're dealing with to start with. That. You've probably need a couple of people that not know about that. That's really useful, isn't it? But then you need other people that are doing other things in the community. And it's really good to have to, I think, also have a spread of ages and, and experience. Because it just, you know, it, it, it enables everybody to learn from everybody else and, it, and you get a better decision. So what would you consider to be an optimal number that you would have on the board? I don't like any more than about five or six. Um, it's sometimes you have to have more than that because you might have different <coughs> sub organisations and that sort of thing. But I reckon five or six, probably eight's getting starting to stretch it. Because then it's becoming more of a committee and you're going to have harder decision making. Um, but you know, it just it depends also how they how they're made up because. You know, you could have, say, four people that are from within the sport that you're dealing with, and four people that aren't. Eight people could do that. You could do it with six. Or, you know, it's, it, it's really getting the skill levels and getting the right sort of attitudes that's more important, I think, than the number. Any more questions? Or? Right, so on behalf of um, Sport Room <coughs> 2 and all of us here, thank you, John, for such a great presentation. Who could have believed that uh, board ethics and uh, conflict resolution could cause so many laughter? So once again, thank you very much, and this is a small gift of our um, appreciation. <laughs>